fitness. Hey, uh, so good morning, everyone. So I'd like to first thank the organizers for organizing such a great workshop. And in my talk, I would like to focus on the impact of the constraints on the CGM. And I would like to argue that maybe if we bring constraints into consideration, we may potentially understand some puzzles in the CGM. So uh, now we know that the CGM is a multi-phase, right? So it contains the hot gas above 10 to the 6 Kelvin, and also it contains the cool gas at around 10 to 4 Kelvin. So that is indicated by the atmosphere emission and also absorption. And if we consider the cool gas, or let's say the cool gas is striking, why is that? So first of all, the cool gas, the temperature, are not at the river temperature. We know that the gas need to maintain a high temperature. Therefore, they can have high pressure to support themselves against gravity. Otherwise, they will fall into the central galaxy and cannot remain at a very large radii, just like the balloon here, right? You know, the balloon needs to remain hot to float in the sky. Otherwise, it will sink. But now we know that the gas is only 10 to 4 Kelvin. That is way below the river temperature. So how can it stay at a very large radii instead of falling into the center of galaxy, right? So that is the part of one. The part two is that people find that the cool gas and hot gas, they are not in pressure equilibrium. The density of the cool gas is at least one order of magnitude smaller than the value required to maintain pressure equilibrium with the hot gas, which means that maybe the hot gas will try to push the cool gas or will try to squeeze the cool gas and cool gas will not be stable, right? So the puzzle two is that, so if the cool gas is under pressure, so how can it be stable, right? So the second, so the second puzzle. The third thing is that there's a lot of cool gas. So in your Milky Way galaxy, uh, it's at least 10 to the 10 solar mass. And you can find cool gas in both star forming and around non-star forming galaxies and has a very high curve fraction. So previously we think that, okay, the gas halo must be hot because there's a lot of feedback process to heat it up. But actually when we see it, it's cool. Something like that, we want to see lava here, but actually we see is snow and the snow and lava can coexist. So I do think that the cool gas is indeed striking. And also have chat a lot about our six, right? So uh, long-standing problem. And of course, it is part of two. The first thing is that we know that the O6 only can only be found around star forming gases, but not in around non-star forming gases. And also we know that the O6 has a very flat profile. It does not decrease with the increase of the radii, right? The third thing is that is O6 is a kind of co-spatial with low ions. So if we say the low six trace the warm gas, so why the warm gas always stay together with the cool gas? And finally, we know that the O6 corresponding to the temperature of three times 10 to the fifth Kelvin. So that is, that sits at the peak of the cooling curve. So it corresponds to very short, length, very short cooling time, which means that if this is true, the warm gas will quickly cool down to 10 to four Kelvin. And therefore we should not see any, cool, any warm gas at all. But even, even such a short cooling time, so why we can still see a lot of O6 around star forming gases. So I think these are the puzzles in the CGM. So that really puzzles me a lot. So in this talk, I would like to uh, try to argue that maybe if we include the cosmic rays and this puzzles could be resolved. And here I say the cosmic ray could be important. The could means that because we have a lot of assumptions, for example, which we similarly concentrate not as particles, but as fluids. And we assume that it has some diffusion and streaming. So it's really a kind of the model dependent uh, stuff. So I say the cosmic ray could be important. So if this assumption is not too far away from the reality. The basic idea is that because we have a supernova explosion, you know, in the central galaxy, and that will try to uh, have some energy input, uh, output, and the 10% of the energy will be converted in cosmic ray, and the cosmic ray can diffuse and stream 
into the CGM, so you can build a profile on the CGM. So that is a basic model. So this is the first glance of the simulation with and you know, without cosmic ray. The left side, uh, the MHT plus means that it comes to everything, the magnetic fields, uh, viscosity, conduction, everything except for cosmic ray. And the right hand side, the CR plus means that it is identical to the left hand side. And the only difference is that it contains cosmic ray. So this is apple to apple comparison. And you can find that without cosmic ray, the entire halo is really hot, right? But with cosmic rays, the halo become really cool. So that is a huge impact. And if we look at this more quantitatively, you can find that with without cosmic ray, most gas stay above 10 to the fifth carbon, so in the warm and hot regime. But with cosmic ray, most of the gas stays below 10 to the fifth carbon. So it seems that the cosmic ray can have a huge impact on the phases of the CGM. You can shift the phase of CGM from the hot end to the cool end. So you might be wondering, why is that? So we can look at the, the, the pressure uh, gradient profile as a function of the radius. So here on the top panel, so there's the null cost ray. And if you look at the blue curve, that is the thermal pressure. So that is comparable with the black dotted curve. So that is the gravity potential, the potential, right? So which means that if there's no cosmic ray, the gas need to remain hot. So it can have a high enough pressure to play against gravity, right? So that is our naive thoughts. So because you can see that the gas need to have a high temperature because so it have a high pressure, so it can balance against gravity. So there's no way the gas must be hot. But now, if we include cosmic rays, you can see that the blue curve, that is the gas thermal pressure, becomes at, least, uh, at most two orders of magnitude lower. And instead, that is the green curve, that is the pressure of cosmic ray, that is comparable with gravity. So if the halo becomes cosmic ray dominated, then the gas can be supported by cosmic pressure. And we know that the cosmic pressure will be proportional to the cosmic velocity over some stream uh, velocity of cosmic rays. And also the, the radius of the, uh, the, radi the, 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 square, the square of the radius of the galaxy, right? And that is independent of the gas, the gas temperature. Therefore, if we rely on cosmic ray pressure to support the gas, then the gas does not need to be hot anymore, and it can be very cool. So that is the biggest difference with you know, without cosmic ray. And if we can put this two equation together, we can solve for a dense profile. It's so called the equilibrium density profile. So what does the equilibrium word mean? So it means that as some radius r, if the local density is greater than this equilibrium density profile, then locally there will not be enough consumer pressure to support it. So it must sink, right? So on the contrary, as the radius r, if the density of the gas is smaller than this equilibrium density profile, then locally there will be too much cosmic pressure to support it, to act on it. So the gas must float. So in other words, only when the gas density equals this equilibrium density profile, as the materials are, the gas can survive, right? And you can find that this density is independent of the temperature. That's very important. And that is exactly what we see from our simulations. So on the top path, so here I show uh, the gas of uh, the gas density profile as a function of the radius, and different color means different phases of the gas. And if there's no cosmic ray, you can see that the cool gas must stay at a very large density, and the hot gas must stay at a very low density. So that makes sense, right? Because 
if there's no cusp ray, different phase of gas must be in pressure equilibrium, right? So the hot gas must stay at a low density and the cool gas must stay at a high density. But now with cusp ray, you can find that no matter the gas is cool or hot, it always stay at a very similar density. And the, the dashed lines is our analytical solution. You can find that. So our simulation will meet uh, this analytical solution very well. And that will lead to a very important implication that is the cool phase must be under pressure, right? We have a different phase of gas. They have different temperatures, but they have the same density. Then the cool gas, the pressure of the cool gas must be smaller than the pressure of the hot gas. So that can help us understand why we can see a lot of unpressured cool gas in the CGM. So maybe that's supported by the non thermal pressure from the cosmic rays. And now you might be wondering that if the gas are not in pressure equilibrium, so why they can be stable? So here what we can do is we can make a cut at some fixed radii and expand it. So here we can see, uh, I show the map of the thermal pressure and in, as, as some fixed radii. So it is relevant from uh, the gravity. And you can see that indeed the gas are not in thermal pressure equilibrium at all, right? We have some high pressure here. We have some low pressure here. But if you look at the cosmic pressure, you can find that the two map are anti-correlated, right? We have some high pressure here, some pressure here. We have some low cosmic pressure here. So in other words, the sum of the thermal pressure and the cosmic pressure at a given radii is a constant, which means that although the gas are out of thermal pressure equilibrium, but they're in total pressure equilibrium if you can bring cosmic ray pressure into consideration. And also we found that the kinematics of the CGM is greatly modified by cosmic pressure. So here, what I show is the top handle. So that is velocity, the velocity uh, slice plot. And also on the bottom panel, so that is uh, the native uh, of the velocity divergence. So that shows the compressibility of the gas. You can find that if there's no cosmic ray and the entire halo is dominated by inflow gas, and it has a very strong river shock, right? There's a lot of shock fronts in the halo. And with cosmic ray, you can find that there's a very extended cell-driven outflows in the biconical region. And, and the structure of the velocity structure is totally different. And also you can find that there's no shock front at all. Right? So it seems that the real shock disappears in, the, in our cosmic ray run. So why is that? So one way we can see that is we can compare the cooling time and the inflow time. So here, I, the color, so the color part is the distribution of the gas cooling time, and the black line is the inflow time of the gas. You can find that without cosmic ray, and most of the gas, uh, for most of the gas, the cooling time is larger or comparable with the inflow time. But with cosmic ray pressure, most of the gas, the cooling time will become shorter than the inflow time. Therefore, if the halo is dominated by constant pressure, then the gas can efficiently radiate away its energy before accreted into the central galaxy. Therefore, there will not be enough thermal pressure to support a stable river shock front. Therefore, there's no shock at all, right? So that is a huge difference with and you know, without the cosmic ray. And you might be wondering, so why the cooling time is so different with or without cosmic ray? Then we can look at the thermal stabilities because the thermal stabilities behavior are totally different with and without cosmic ray. If there's no cosmic pressure, we know that different phase of gas there must be in thermal pressure equilibrium, right? Then the cool gas must be pressure confined into a very small volume. And the rest of the space must be filled 
with the very warm feeling, long cooling time, hot phase. So the entire uh, system will have a very long cooling time. But if we include cotton rays, we can find that the entire gas halo can be out of thermal pressure equilibrium, liquid metal, right? And then the gas can cool down, but still maintains a very diffuse, very volume filling state. Therefore, the system will have a very short cooling time. And with that, we can better understand about our observations. So here I show uh, the column of density profile of, of H1, and the blue curve is our MHD1, and uh, the orange curve is our customary one. And the stars and arrows are from observation data. And you can find that the biggest difference between the MHD1 and CR1 come from here, this part, right? So it's that non customary is a large scattering here. And it has a very low, lower limit. But with customary, the scattering is much less. And it has a very high low limit. And if you look at the upward arrows here, so that is the observational low limit. So I would say that maybe observation will prefer our customer one. So why is that? As I mentioned before, so if there's no customer A, so the cool gas must maintain pressure equilibrium with a half phase, then it must be pressure confined into a very small region, right? So this is the picture. And if you shoot one cyclone, it might penetrate some cool gas, will give you very, very high, will, will give you a very large value. And maybe some side line will penetrate no cool gas at all, and that will give you a very low limit. So therefore, if there's no cotton ray, there will be a very large scatter, and also it will have a very low, low limit. But now, with cotton ray, we know that the gas can be out of pressure equilibrium, so it can maintain, the cool gas can maintain a very volume filling, very uniform phase. So no matter how do you draw the sidelines, they always give you very similar value. So I would say the profile of the, the, of the H1 or the, the scattering or the low limit of H1 will tell you, will indicate what is status of the cool gas in the CGN. And also we can look at what we care about is the O6. Again, the orange value or the orange line is our CR1 and the blue value is the, our MHD1. So it's very clear that uh, our CR1 will fit the observational data extremely well. And it can maintain a very high oxygen column density up to 150 kiloparsec away. So that is really exciting thing. And why is that? So here we can look at uh, the O6 contribution as a function of density and temperature. And you can find that if there is no customary, most O6 come from the warm half phase. So that is mostly come from the collision ionization. But with customary, you can find that the o, most, o, most of O6 come from the diffuse low temperature gas. So that is mostly from the photon ionization. This is because the customary can maintain can make the gas diffuse in a volume filling, so that can be very easily photoionized. And that can also help us understand why the profile of O6 is pretty flat, because if you go to the very large radii, although the total gas number density drops, but the efficiency of the photonization will increase. So therefore, even at very large radii, you can still see a lot of photonized O6. So the summary is that maybe if we include the non thermal customary impact, we can perhaps understand the puzzle in the CGM. So for the cool gas, so why it's stable, why it's in the dense, and why it has a very large curl fraction, so maybe because the cool gas is supported by constant pressure, then it does not care about the gas temperature anymore. And for the warm gas, so why it can be there even it's very short cooling time. So why it is uh, cost special with the low ions? Maybe the warm gas are mostly come from the photonized 
gas, right? So it's actually it's not warm, and actually it's it's cool. And also, why you can only see warm gas, a so-called warm gas or round star forming gases, because we know that the CL luminosity is related to a star formation rate, right? So if there's no star formation, there'll be a very little concentrated luminosity. So there will be no CL supported halo. So I think the bottom line is that I think the microphysical, the non thermal process, such as magnetic fields and cosmic rays and turbulence and so on, that are very important for us to understand the physics of gas halo. So that's all, and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Su Ching. Uh, it was a, a very clear explanation of the potential impacts of cosmic rays on the, on the CGM and on the halo. Um, we already, yeah, so as I, as I mentioned, just for everyone's reference, we'll, um, we'll take a, like 10 minutes or so of discussion in here, and then I encourage people who are interested in continuing the discussion to go into the appropriately themed breakout room um, before we get started with Huan Lee's turbulence discussion. But um, I think the first person who had their hand raised was Drummond. Would you, what would you like to ask? Yep. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Hi, Ching. Very clear, nice presentation as usual. Um, could you go back to that slide 14? Your your cursor is floating over. Yes, here. Um, yeah. So when I look at H1 absorption in papers by all of the wonderful observers on this talk, mm -hmm. the H1 absorption is coming from very narrow or, you know, forget H1, you know, magnesium 2, silicon 2, tracing that sort of, you know, cool 10 to the 4 Kelvin gas. It comes from very narrow absorption lines. And I know Cameron was a co-author on, on this paper with you. So I was wondering if you could say anything about the line widths of the low ions in these two scenarios and if the CR plus halo line widths are actually consistent uh, as you're showing the you know, the integrated ion column densities are? Yeah, so that is a good question. So actually, uh, it's indeed, so our future plan is we can probe uh, the, line ratio, uh, the, the line width by looking at the synthetic uh, CR sp spectra from our uh, CR observations. But now I do not have a, a clear conclusion for that. But I think the total thing is that, uh, the, the main thing is that because if we include the rain, and the cool gas will be volume, volume filling. So it should correspond to a very large coherent land scale, right? So if that is true, we should see a lot of motions that might be coherent um, uh, at some land scale. So that will definitely impact uh, our uh, the synthetic spectra. Of the uh, uh, so of the absorption lines, so that is yeah, I think you might right see now. some very broad, some very so broad that's, cold ions. Yeah, but also it is kind of uh, depends on so what is the coherent land scale. So that is something we can I cannot say for now for sure, but it's definitely something we want to check in the future. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, excellent question, and I think there are a lot of uh, clear ways in which this can be tested and put constraints on by the observations on yes. just what the strength is. So it's it's future work, I think. Yeah. Um, all right, uh, next question from Yong. Yes, Hi. thank you. Uh, thank you, Soqing, that's a really great talk. So yesterday, Pam mentioned in the ISM, there's energy equipartition between the gas pressure and the magnetic field and turbulence and whatever, everything's in it. Yes. And then he mentioned in the CGM, actually gas pressure dominates. So I was wondering, in your model right now, when you pump a lot of cosmic rays into it and boost the cosmic rate pressure, how does that energy equipartition scenario look like? Ah, I see. And related to that question, and so you assume that there is 10% of the supernova energy goes into the cosmic rays, and how does that affect the, the overall outcomes of the CGM? Yeah, uh, so great question. So if you come to the world of so-called equipartition. So I'm not. Uh, so I do not like that equipartition words uh, very much. The reason is that. So when we say equipartition, we must understand what is the physics behind, right? So for example, you have some turbulent dynamo. We have. We say we have equipartition between the the kinetic energy and the metal energy. 
So what you imply is that maybe some growth rate will be balanced by some damping rate. So that will give you the so-called equipartition, right? But the equipartition is not a universal rule because we need to identify what is the fix behind. So what is really the balanced force between the two parts, right? So now in our CGM case, the key thing is that is the balancing of the, uh, so the balancing is between the gravity and the pressure gradient of constant pressure, right? So that's this two part is comparable. So maybe the partition between the thermal energy and the customer pressure might not hold, right? Because what is really balancing between these two is the customer energy and the gravitational potential. So I will not say that, so I will not think that maybe the equipartition, uh, so I would say that the equipartition might not be a good assumption in a CGM. But also, I would say that if you want to consider the confinement and cost rate and how it interacts with the magnetic fields, the very small scale, so maybe there's some, there's still some balance over there. So maybe you can say some equipartition from that side, but on a global, on a global scale, so we do not anticipate equipartition between the thermal energy and the customer energy. And come to uh, your second question. Yes, uh, the star formation rate is really important because our model assumes that there's 10% of the thermal energy will go to customer energy. So that is based on, uh, I will not say solid, but uh, it's a widely accepted number of 10%. And also, uh, so that is what I can say right now. So, uh, so I'll say, if you want to understand that better, so indeed, how much, so what's the percentage of the, of the spinal energy will go to spinal energy, you need to do some more detailed study. So maybe the parking cell study to figure out the number, but 10% is at least a reasonable, num a reasonable number, number for now. Yeah. Okay, cool. so we're, we're um, bumping up on the time before we start our next tutorial by Yuan Li. So I invite, I know there are a number of hands raised. I'm sorry we didn't get to. I invite everyone, including those who have their hands raised or, or people who are a little bit more uh, hesitant to ask a question but want to stay on for this discussion, to go into the breakout room uh, specified with cosmic rays. So Ching will also go there and be able to continue this discussion. Um, we will start uh, Yuan Li's tutorial at 8.40 in three minutes, and then, um, if you guys want to come back from the other breakout room in the next bit, um, you can catch hers or catch Mateusz Ruzkowski's uh, tutorial at 920. But I'll check in um, there and let you guys know when Mateusz is be about to begin. <laughs>